The forced removal of the Cherokee people to a strange new land in the West brought about changes in our traditional plants, materials, and other parts of daily life. In this Cherokee Almanac, we explore the ways in which our ancestors held on to our culture in a turbulent time. Since time immemorial, Cherokee people inhabited what is known today as the Southeastern United States. As people indigenous to the Appalachian Mountains, our material, spiritual, and political lifeways coexisted with and depended on our connection to the ecosystems of that place. Our people knew that life depended on the land, uh, the water, or other than human relatives, animals, plants, and without that, we wouldn't survive. However, after our forced removal from our homelands in 1838, Cherokee people in Indian territory had to find ways to connect and recreate traditional lifeways in a foreign landscape. Cherokee people had a vast pharmacopoeia when it came to medicine. The pharmacy was the land itself. The average Cherokee person would have known about hundreds of plants for various treatments, remedies, and of course we had specialists, healers, medicine people. A lot of that was lost when Cherokee people were forced out of our homelands. The last detachment of Cherokees on the Trail of Tears arrived in Indian Territory on March 24, 1839, after their months-long journey of nearly 1,000 miles. This would be the first time all Cherokee people residing west of the Mississippi River would be united. Although this forced relocation had devastating consequences for Cherokee society, the reconstituted Cherokee nation west of the Mississippi began slowly working to cultivate a connection to the new lands. And then the lands themselves felt very much like home because of those rolling hills of the, the Ozark Highlands. Cherokee people could, to a large extent, still maintain our Cherokee ways of life. They had lived and the, they had uh, practiced in the homelands. Nearly a third of the plant species used by generations of our people for traditional medicines, food, fiber, and dye were not found growing in the new landscapes of Indian Territory. Of the 739 plants documented to have been used by Cherokee people prior to our forced removal, 230 of them were not native to what is now Oklahoma. Some of the medicine formulas would have had to change because some of the plants they had in the East aren't here. They might be different and they have different effects and things. So. All of this resulted in a major transition period for the Cherokee people. Indigenous plants were not the only cultural challenges brought about by the relocation. Some cultural aspects, such as language and music, were carried with Cherokees over the removal routes. One Cherokee was Samuel Worcester, and he helped a guy named Lowell Mason do this singing book, and it's all instructions on how to sing, and it's in, written in Cherokee. The ones that he uh, did is the ones they brought to through the trail. That book uh, is still alive today. We still use it. Nobody put them on a CD and brought them here. Those songs that came to this part of the world, they came out of their mouths and out of their hearts and their minds, what they knew. And they were singing songs of comfort over and over. My great-grandfather was 18 months old when he came on the trail. Some of those songs were, were sung as, as lullabies or, um, you know, just let's sing a song. Right now, the language, we're in a state of transition. Our last generation of first language speakers, they're, at, you know, they're near retirement. A lot of them are passing away. So we're going to reach a point at some point in the future where our last, you know, speaker, their, their language, their first language is Cherokee, they won't be here anymore. So what we're doing now through the language revitalization programs at Cherokee Nation is trying to create new speakers. So these people, English is their first language, but they're learning Cherokee. We're in a transition and Cherokee is not going to sound how your grandmother sounds or how their grandmother sounds. It's going to be different, but it's, going, it's still going to be Cherokee. Despite the challenges posed by our forced removal to Indian Territory, Cherokee people continue to perpetuate our indigenous knowledge and work to preserve it for our present and future generations. So when we think about a resurgence, a revitalization of these land-based ways of knowing and these land-based practices, 
that's something that we see a thirst for today among our youth. And we also see an urge by our elders, many of the elders who I work with, to pass on their knowledge. There's this resurgence of pride among uh, natives and Cherokees, and especially the younger generation, seeing an opportunity to express themselves in this world. This attitude change as a result of, you know, like my parents' generation and their parents' generation, they paved the way for us. You know, they fought for our rights and ways to be viewed in and ways to express ourselves. They fought for that. And now we're taking up what they'd laid for us and we're making new expressions.